Greetings. Welcome to PCAP's last Native Prairie Speaker Series of 2023. My name is Caitlin Moreau Seiler, and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Emily Putz, a Stewardship Coordinator with Nature Saskatchewan, will be speaking about monarchs and native plants. Before we begin, I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Just a few items before we get going, I'd like to note that PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. And our first webinar in 2024 will be about brewing owls in Alberta by Stefano Ligioli from Alberta Environment and Parks. And this will be on January 25th. And as usual, you can register on the PCAP website. As we're taking a little break over the holiday season, if you miss our webinars, be sure to check out the PCAP YouTube channel where most of our presentations have been recorded and are available to watch at your convenience. My personal favorite of 2023 was one about snowy owls, so be sure to check that one out. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, as we have over 100 registrants, I think we're almost at 200 registrants, um, you will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, just type it into the Q&A section of the webinar dashboard anytime, and feel free to upvote other people's questions if you have the same one, and I'll try my best at moderating at the end. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, North American Helium, Nutrien, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and SASTEL. Now, a bit about today's presenter. Emily Pitt first started working in the field of conser conservation biology in 2014, and instantly knew it was the career path for her. She graduated from the University of Regina in 2015 with a degree in biology, uh, with a concentration in ecology and environmental biology. Her career has been species at risk focus, and in 2016, she was hired as a habitat stewardship coordinator at Nature Saskatchewan, where she spent time coordinating all five of their species at risk programs. She currently coordinates Shrubs for Strikes, Plovers on Shore, and Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program. While not in the field scoping out species at risk, she and her partner live on a property by Silton, Saskatchewan, with their dog, cats, horses, goose, and ducks. So with that, I will pass it over to Emily. I'll just share my screen. Okay, I think um, that should be on the right screen there. So thanks for having me, everyone. Um, so like Caitlin mentioned, my name is Emily Putz, and I work for Nature Saskatchewan. Um, so I just wanted to start the presentation a bit with a bit about Nature Saskatchewan um, for those of you that don't know of us or haven't heard of us before. So we are a non-government charitable organization. Um, we're member-based, so we have about 700 members and 16 affiliate nature societies and local communities across the province. Um, so, and this year, or next year, I should say, in uh, 2024, we're actually celebrating 75 years. So we've been a voice for nature in Saskatchewan for 75 years now. So the Stewards of Saskatchewan programs work under the Nature, nature Saskatchewan. Um, it's a suite of five voluntary stewardship programs that have been working with landowners since 1987. So our first program, Operation Burrowing Owl, um, kind of piloted, piloted that year, and we've been going ever since with these programs. So they're long, long running and fairly successful. So uh, the motto for the programs is Habitat Conservation Through Landowner Stewardship. Essentially, they are community science programs that work directly with folks to conserve, maintain, and monitor habitat for species at risk. Um, so each program works through an ambassador species for a different habitat type, and each year participants are asked to report on the species they see in our annual census. So participants promise not to knowingly destroy habitat for their target species, and we provide um, enhancement opportunities uh, like wildlife friendly fence funding or our beneficial management practice plans um, 
as well, all data collected with permission is funneled through to the federal uh, recovery team leads for that specific species, as well as the S Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center. So um, kind of all our participants work as our eyes and ears and allows us to gather a large amount of data and uh, contribute to species recovery through that. So what does this have to do with monarchs? Um, so monarchs are part of our Stewards of Saskatchewan banner program. And this year specifically, we kind of targeted them as a highlight species within that program and kind of rolled out some new things for them. Um, so today I kind of just wanted to talk um, a bit about monarchs themselves and our new programming um, that we have for them. So the monarch butterfly. So monarchs are actually found across the globe in Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands, North and South America. But our North American monarchs are really unique in that they're the only ones that do that multi-generational mass migration throughout the range. Um, they're currently listed in Canada um, as special concern, but COSIWIC has recommended them to be uplisted as endangered. And that will likely be in the next year or so. So how to ID a monarch? Um, so there's lots of orange and black butterflies out there on the prairies. Um, so how do you know if you're looking at a monarch? So monarchs have are fairly large butterflies. Their wingspan is eight to 12 centimeters long. Um, they have bright orange wings with black veining. The females have darker veining, thicker veining than the males. And males have two little uh, spots on their hind wings that are scent glands, and they're fairly evident when the wings are open and when the wings are closed. So if you want to get really nerdy and tell your males and females apart, that's how you do it. Uh, the wing margins have those white spots on them, and there's usually two rows of those white spots, and the spots are like vaguely oval shaped. And the black body has white spotting and banding on it. So I mentioned that there's lots of black and orange butterflies on the prairie. So um, you, you're often playing kind of the lookalike game and none are better than mimicking monarchs than the viceroy. So many different butterflies species take advantage of the monarch's toxic qualities by mimicking their coloration. Um, and the viceroys do this best. Their name literally means in place of the king or monarchs. Um, so the easiest way right away is to look at the hind wing and the viceroys, they have a strong black vein that bisects the wings. And you can see that both when the wing is open and when it's closed. So if you look at that line, you can tell right away that it's a viceroy rather than a monarch. Um, they're also a little bit smaller than a monarch, but that's hard to tell if you don't have the two side by side. Um, their wing margins, they have white spots as well, but they tend to be more crescent shaped, which is extra evident when the wings are closed. You can kind of see in that uh, bottom right photo there that the, the white markings are very crescent shaped along the wing margin. Um, and then their flight pattern is quite different as well. So monarchs are very large butterflies. They are long distance travelers. Um, so they, they need to make every movement really efficient for them. So they have a very distinct flap, flap, glide um, kind of flight pattern. Whereas smaller non-migratory butterflies like the viceroy, uh, they have a much more erratic flight uh, pattern. So they kind of just like flap all over the place from flower to flower. So while monarchs have many mimics throughout the range, in Saskatchewan there are three other butterfly types that, in addition to viceroys, that are easily confused with the monarch. So I, I thought I'd just go through a couple of them. Um, so they're, all three of these guys are much, much smaller than a monarch. Um, and, you know, you might look at them and say, well, they look way different when you see them side by side like that. But um, we do get many calls in of mistaken identity with these butterflies each year, especially the painted lady. So um, so yeah, so these three are uh, fritillary butterflies. So there's actually a number of species of that guy, uh, red admirals and the painted lady. I think the painted lady gets confused the most because it has that um, kind of the same color of orange on its wings and those white spots along its margins. 
So now we're gonna talk a bit about Monarch's life cycle and how to ID each of the stages of its life cycle. So we'll start with the egg. Um, so monarch eggs are ridged and they're pointed at the top. Um, and you'll often see kind of just, the, there might be a couple on leaves, but they're not densely clustered. So you'll see just the one like in that picture. Um, the egg is only about a millimeter across, so it's very small. So the caterpillars are very brightly colored. Um, they are trying to warn of their toxic nature. So they're trying to yell, don't eat me. Um, so they have bold yellow, black and white banding right across them. And caterpillars, there are a number of sizes depending on when you see them in their life cycle. So they can be very tiny um, or they can uh, be quite big and noticeable. So you wanna make sure you're checking the underside of leaves, especially really carefully. The chrysalises, um, when they're new and fresh, they're that bright green color um, that you can kind of see in the middle there. Um, and then as the butterfly develops in them, they fade to transparent white and you can see the adult developing um, through right through the chrysalis. Um, and they have a zipper along the top part of the chrysalis that's black and gold. And that's evident right across until the adult butterfly emerges. And it's that gold is kind of a little shimmery too. So, all right, so lots of writing on this slide, but this is just a kind of an overview of uh, the monarch butterfly's life cycle. So adult butterflies, they'll live for around a month in their spring and summer generations, and their fall generation will live over winter about nine months. So I'll explain uh, the differences of those in a second here. Um, so females, they'll disperse up to 400 eggs on milkweed plants, um, and those eggs take around four to five days to hatch generally. The caterpillars, once they've hatched, they go through five growth stages and they get bigger each time. Um, so by the end, they're about 2000 times bigger than when they first hatched out. And um, that they do this over a two week period. They can form a chrysalis in just a few hours and they'll stay in it for about two weeks before emerging as an adult and starting the whole life cycle again. So I mentioned the spring and summer generations and the fall generations. So what am I talking about? So there are three to four generations of monarch each summer. Um, each generation only lives a few weeks as they migrate northward. So they take about uh, three generations to get up. And then usually the late August generation up here um, is the fourth generation. And it's the one that does the big migration southwards. So they do that whole flight southwards and they overwinter down in their wintering grounds in Mexico and they'll lay the next generation's eggs in the spring. So this is a 6,000 mile round trip. And Saskatchewan's really special for this actually, because we are at the north part of their range. So our monarchs that stay here um, and the ones that are born here in the summer are the, those special ones that will live a really long time and do the whole migration self. So I mentioned many times that monarchs are toxic. Um, so why are they toxic? And that would be because of the milkweed. So um, usually when you hear people talking about monarchs, uh, they talk about milkweed as well. They go hand in hand. And that's because monarchs are milkweed obligate species. So they require milkweed to complete their life cycle. Um, female monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweed plants. And once the caterpillars hatch, they'll exclusively feed on milkweed plants. Um, and milkweed has toxic qualities. So it's passed to the caterpillars and they uh, keep it with them right through their life cycle. So the adults taste really, really bad to predators. Um, and they kind of rely on this as predator deterrent. So in Saskatchewan, we have five species of milkweed that are native to here. Um, so that's common milkweed, showy milkweed, dwarf milkweed, green milkweed, and world milkweed. And I'm just gonna go through each of those briefly. So uh, we try and raise awareness on what those native milkweeds look like so th that people can ID them if they have them out on their lands. So common milkweed I'll go through first. So despite its name, it's actually very rare uh, native um, 
growing wild in Saskatchewan. Um, however, it is one of the most common ones that you can find in a greenhouse variety. So there are hort horticultural varieties. Um, so if you do have milkweed in your garden, it might be common milkweed, but to find it growing out into, in the wild in Saskatchewan, it's very rare. Um, it's got big globes of pink flowers uh, and very broad leaves. So monarch butterflies like it, especially because those broad leaves have a lot of surface area. Uh, for their eggs and for the caterpillars to feed on. Showy milkweed is likely the most common one that we have called in when people are um, telling us about their milkweed. Um, it grows in lots of ditches in Saskatchewan, especially in kind of the Swift Current area, um, but it'll go right across southern Saskatchewan. Um, it also has big globes of pink flowers. Um, however, they're, they tend to be a little more whitish pink and the individual flowers themselves have elongated points on them. So they're a little bit, bit more star shaped and it has broad leaves as well. So um, monarchs like it quite a bit as well. Dwarf milkweed, this is one of our most common um, wild varieties as well. Um, so it's also called oval leaved or low milkweed. It's quite low growing to the ground compared to showy or common. Um, and the flower heads are white and not as dense as showy um, or common milkweed. Um, it also has fairly broad leaves, so it is another favorite of monarchs. Um, and you can find this one in garden centers, uh, especially your native nursery garden centers. Green milkweed. Um, that one's also common in Saskatchewan, but it prefers sandy soils. And like its name suggests, it has, uh, its flowers are kind of closed looking and, and greenish tinged. And lastly, world milkweed is very rare in Saskatchewan. Um, it has white flowers as well, like the dwarf milkweed, but its leaves are very linear. So they're very grass-like. Um, and it's unknown if monarchs really can use this one as much as the others. So this slide is just to show what milkweed looks like throughout the summer in different parts of its life cycles. Um, it can look quite different depending on what time of the year you're looking at it. Uh, so if you're out there trying to figure out if you have milkweed, um, you're, you'll want to know what time you're looking for it in. So um, uh, most plants have those big globes of flowers, but then when the pods develop, the pods can be either smooth or kind of spiky depending on the species you're looking at. And the seeds, once those pods pop open, are very fluffy. So um, you might be saying, but I have other milkweed in my garden and it was none of those other species. So I thought I'd just go through some other species of milkweed uh, with you guys. So swamp milkweed is likely the most common I hear about. Um, so it's actually not native to Saskatchewan, but it is native Manitoba eastwards, and it's got purple blooms and quite narrow leaves. So monarchs seem to like it, but it, it's not, um, it doesn't have those broad leaves of some of our other native species, which um, would have more surface area for the caterpillars to feed on. And then we have our problematic milkweed species. Um, so southern species of milkweed are often uh, as you know, um, attracting monarchs, good for monarchs. Um, I've seen them in garden centers with big stickers on them saying, um, we'll draw monarchs to your garden. Um, but sometimes they can be more detrimental than helpful. So orange milkweed or butterfly weed or few flowered milkweed are actually two species of brightly orange flowering milkweed um, that can be found in many garden centers. Um, so this is actually two different species and they're easily mistaken for one another and one's a little worse than the other. So one of them uh, like orange milkweed and or it's also called butterfly weed. Um, it is native to the southern parts of uh, Quebec and Ontario in Canada, but it's not native to here. And then its range extends to the southeastern United States. Um, and then the more problematic one is few flower milkweed, which is also orange blooming and looks very similar. And it's native to Florida and Texas. So they're both brightly blooming and a good nectar source. They'll attract monarchs to your garden. 
However, they're not um, adapted to our climate and can actually cause problems for the monarch's life cycle by um, making them stick around longer. Um, the blooming times are off, so it just kind of confuses them a little bit. And then the worst one would be tropical milkweed. So that's the one on the left there that's kind of red and yellow flowers. Um, so that one is actually, um, I've seen it sold in uh, garden centers now, even though the word is kind of more out there that it's not the best. And its native range is Mexico into Central and South America. Um, but now it can be found right across the globe, unfortunately. So it's uh, widespread across China and Australia. Uh, where it's labeled as an exotic weed. So this one can again disrupt the life cycle of migratory monarch butterflies, but it can also spread parasites that can cause deformed wing disease in, in the adults when they hatch. Okay, so those are milkweed, but what about all the other species of flowers? So the adult monarchs, um, they actually require a number of nectaring species as well, because the adults don't feed exclusively on milkweed. They get their energy source from a wide variety of plants around them. Um, and the best ones for that energy source are, of course, our native plants. So I just kind of wanted to go through a few and their importance to monarchs. Um, so native plants, they evolved specifically um, to our climate and to our native pollinators. So they're the best options, generally. So this is just a few of them. And I've kind of split them this slide into our early and mid-season native species and the next slide into the late blooming species. And that's because it's important when you're creating monarch habitat to have both. Um, and that's because the butterflies that are arriving here need energy early in the season um, to be able to lay that next generation. And then the late generation that hatches here, um, when they're adults, they're actually needing a lot of energy, a lot of nectar um, to make that giant flight southwards. So they're trying to store up as much energy as they can before they leave um, for the summer and make that big flight south. So here are some native earlier blooming or mid-season blooming um, species. Uh, so we do have a number of native thistles that monarchs love, um, bergamot, yarrow, prairie clover, um, all kinds of different ones. And then these are some of those late blooming species. So blazing star, goldenrod, um, smooth aster, coneflower, they kind of bloom later into this um, August. And uh, they're really good for those um, adults that are trying to gain energy to leave here at the end of summer. And then, of course, there are other species out there that monarchs will use that are maybe not native to our variety. So um, dandelions especially are very important. Lots of people have heard them that they're good for bumblebees that are emerging in the spring. So they're good for those monarchs that are arriving early in the spring as well. Um, they have lots of nectar, um, as well as sweet clover, white clover, kind of those weedy species and alfalfa. And of course your garden plants will be utilized to a certain extent by monarchs as well. So this is um, kind of just a breakdown of their requirements. And if you're trying to create the perfect monarch habitat on your property, this is just a little diagram to tell you how to do that. Um, so this is actually part of our beneficial management practice plan that we'll hand out to participants that have monarch butterflies in our program. Um, so you want to have milkweed habitat and nectaring plants that are included that include early and late blooming nectaring plants. You want to avoid spraying nearby monarch habitat. Um, if your uh, milkweed patch is right on like a crop margin, you want to leave a little buffer zone. Um, mowing and control burns may be beneficial to the milkweed plants themselves because they actually grow back more vigorously after um, being kind of chopped down. Um, but you want to avoid periods where the eggs and caterpillars and chrysalises are still on those plants because, of course, they cannot move like the adults can. So if you're mowing the milkweed and the caterpillars are on them, good chance are that that generation will be lost. Um, and then in the east of their range, especially, they use specific tree types for roosting and staging habitat. Um, staging habitat is where they kind of like all gather together before they fly down um, south as one 
and a unit. Um, it's unknown actually to what extent they do this on the prairies. We don't have as many trees on the prairies, uh, but they will still use trees as cover in windy uh, conditions. Okay, so now that we've learned all about monarchs, I figured I'd tell you a little bit about what Nature Saskatchewan is doing um, this past summer uh, for those monarchs and how we expanded our community science programming um, a little further in regards to that species. So piloted this summer, uh, we piloted our milkweed monitoring um, project. So this project is open to participants of the Stewards of Saskatchewan Banner Program if they're enrolled for monarchs. And it's basically um, intended as extended monitoring. So if they're already on the lookout for monarchs, we're asking them to kind of um, answer some questions about their milkweed patches themselves. And the goal is to fill some knowledge gaps on the prairies because there's been a lot of research eastward in Ontario uh, focused on the eastern extent of the monarchs in Canada, but um, the prairies have a few knowledge gaps on what our monarchs do over the summer and what kind of habitat they prefer the best. So this is what the form looks like. Um, so right now we have it on a Google form survey. Um, we plan to port it in the future to the survey one, two, three app. Um, so people can just have that app right on their phone and upload pictures through there. Right now you can, you can do this survey if you have any email address, but you can only submit photos if you have a Gmail account. So um, yeah, in the future, we'd like it to be more accessible to everybody. Um, so participants agree that any information collected um, we can share with the Federal Recovery Team and the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center. So as, as I mentioned earlier, this is standard to all our programs, but we want to make clear um, what we're using the data for. So we go over it again here. And basically, we ask all kinds of questions on the patch of milkweed itself that they choose to monitor. So um, they can monitor more than one patch if they wish, if they have a bunch on their on their land, but we ask them to answer specific questions about the same patch over and over again throughout the summer so we can see how that patch itself is doing. Um, so I just wanted to go through a few examples of what we ask. Um, so we ask them, of course, what the date is, when they check their patch, um, what check-in it is, um, the GPS location of the patch, um, as well as where it's located on the property. So is it right in the yard site in somebody's garden? Um, is it on pasture or rangeland, on crop margin, in the ditch, along a road or a trail on their property? Um, anything like that. Uh, it's just important that we know what kind of habitat we're looking at. And then we encourage them to um, upload photos each time um, so that we can um, confirm their IDs on the plants, but we help them ID what kind of milkweed itself is growing in that patch. Um, if it's just one species or if they have numerous species. Um, we ask about plant health and uh, the phenology of the plant, um, just to get a snapshot of the life cycle of the plant itself um, at that date. And then we ask patch specifics that are known to influence the use from uh, female monarchs. So female monarchs are looking for very specific things when they're looking for a milkweed patch that they wanna lay their eggs on. Um, so we ask them questions about surrounding habitat, the patch density, the stem number in the patch. Um, are there other patches nearby on their property? Um, anything like that. Um, we also briefly asked them about threats. So we asked them about their pesticide and herbicide use. Um, these questions are optional, though, if they don't choose to disclose that, um, just in case some people are a little sensitive about some of their practices. So we want to be as inclusive as possible, um, as well as we asked them about their opinion on milkweed. So this is geared a little more towards those that have uh, the milkweed patch land or in their pasture. Um, we want to hear about their opinion, um, having milkweed out there with their livestock. Are they worried about that? Um, or do they not really care because the cow will avoid it? Um, we're interested in hearing those opinions. And then, of course, we ask them about 
monarchs. So we asked them about whether monarchs are present um, and in what stage of the life cycle they are at that time period that they're doing their check-in. So with repeated entries then um, throughout the summer, we can get little screenshots over the entire summer of the milkweeds in this stage. Um, this is how it's doing and this is what life cycle um, stage the monarchs themselves are in using that milkweed patch. Um, and then before we ask them how many adults they see, uh, we also go over lookalikes again, just to make really clear that they are looking at monarchs and not a viceroy. Um, they're really easy to confuse. And then of course we encourage them to upload photos again. And then optionally, we also ask photos or uh, folks that are doing this survey um, about uh, their nectaring species nearby. So um, this is a little more you know, intense. They don't have to do that, um, but we are interested in knowing what nectaring species uh, those monarchs might be using. Um, so we ask about both native and non-native species, and they can again upload photos of native plants. If they're unsure of the ID on them, I can go in and ID them for them. Um, or if we just didn't list them in our list, I kind of chose random common ones um, that I see around. So um, if I didn't include them in the list, they can add those in as well. And of course, we thank them for their time and ask them if they have any other comments. So um, this year, as I mentioned, it was just a pilot project. Um, so we just kind of wanted to try it out with a few participants uh, to see if you know they, they liked doing it over the summer, things we could change. Was it easy to do? Um, did they kind of lose interest after like, the first entry or whether they kept with it all summer? Um, so we had eight participants that tested it for us over the summer breeding season. Uh, two out of the eight check their patches roughly once a month um, from July to August. And they actually both responded that they checked, uh, they were really enthusiastic and they checked their patch way more than that. Um, but they they just filled out the form in completion three times because uh, we just ask for once a month. So um, uh, three out of the eight check their patch twice in July and August. Um, and the rest of them just checked their patch once, uh, but we did have some monarch health issues. So um, there was black death in uh, one of the people's um, monarchs. So that's a bacterial infection and it kind of liquefies all the, the caterpillars and their chrysalises. So they didn't have an, another generation after that, sadly. Um, and then we did have some cases of adult wing deformed Formity also spotted throughout the um, breeding season that our participants mentioned. Um, usually it was showy dwarf and the garden variety of common milkweed that people had in their patches. Um, everybody responded that their patches were getting larger. So there was more, more and more stems there growing, which is unsurprising because milkweed is very good at growing its boundaries. Um, and nine out of the 15 check-ins had monarchs detected as well on their milkweed plants. So altogether, we got 27 reports of caterpillars, 13 chrysalises, and nine adults that were observed um, through our pilot project. So we are hoping to expand this um, next summer and in future years. Um, so it will be open to anybody that wants to participate now that we've kind of tested it out a little bit. Um, so they just have to be uh, participants in our Steers Saskatchewan Banner Program, and then um, the form will be open to them. So I just figured I'd go through some of my favorite parts of this project. Um, so my absolute favorite part was all the photos that they sent back. So seeing everyone get involved, um, one participant actually got their neighbors to come help them check the patch. Um, it was kind of on the edge of um, like a community um, uh, lot. So all their neighbors uh, came out and the knowledge was spread around the community. Um, and then seeing how every patches are, are different. Um, so one participant, every time they uploaded a photo, um, they took a picture of their dog with a bubble. So I really liked seeing him throughout the summer in all the photos. And then uh, we had a participant that had 
uh, their milkweed growing in their garden boxes and they were just covered in monarchs. So uh, those garden environments are useful habitat as well. And then um, just how the patches change each check-in. So we did have a participant that their patches were right on the edge of their crop field. Um, and she was really diligent about checking them um, each time they were out there. So it was really cool to see how that patch changed throughout the season. Okay, so this slide has a lot of text, but it's just basically a summary of what you can do to help. So there's many beneficial and non-beneficial things. Um, and there's a lot of rumors out there about what you can do to help monarchs. So um, this is kind of just a recap of some of the things I talked about already. So um, beneficial things, you can plant native milkweed. Um, so showy dwarf or common milkweed are good options and are often found in greenhouses. Um, or native nurseries. Um, you can plant a pollinator garden, make sure that you have those early and late blooming nectar and species to um, help the monarchs right across the summer. Uh, avoid using herbicide or pesticide near habitat. And of course, report all your sightings um, in so that we can help track where monarchs are in the province and what kind of habitat they're using. Some of the non-beneficial things, um, so again, uh, you want to avoid non-native milkweeds. So don't plant that southern or tropical milkweed. It might seem helpful, but it can affect life cycle and spread harmful diseases. And then a big one that I haven't talked about yet is buying butterfly hatching kits or releasing captive reared butterflies. So I still actually, um, just this summer, I got at least five emails um, from people uh, wanting to know where they could buy monarch butterflies um, to release. And this was actually pushed for a big push a few years ago. Everybody was like, you can you know, help the wild population by releasing these individuals um, in your area. Um, unfortunately, the butterflies that are captive reared don't often have the skills to survive and migrate successfully. Um, they may breed at the wrong time after they're released or hatch unsuccessful offspring that are just not timed to our wild population's life cycle. Um, they're also, because they're reared in such a uh, close proximity um, and density, uh, they can be carriers of diseases and parasites that they can then spread to the wild population when they interbreed um, or just, you know, are in contact with wild individuals. And captive reared monarchs, um, they might have different genetics than the regional populations and they might uh, mix unfavorable genes into the population when they interbreed. So um, yeah, it was a, a, a big push. People were saying it was good, but um, new research was just saying maybe you should support the wild ones that are there rather than uh, captive rearing monarchs. And of course, um, if you have monarchs on your property, um, you can help by joining the Saskatchewan Manor program. Um, so there are some perks to being in the program if you have monarchs. Uh, you get a big fancy gate sign that we personalize for you. Um, we do have our beneficial management practice plan that we hand out to participants with monarchs and it kind of goes through basically everything I um, talked about today. Um, we also uh, give out um, nectar and species butterfly mix that's from one of our uh, native um, seed nurseries in the province. And of course, we also do a milkweed giveaway in the spring. Um, and that's also from one of the native nurseries. And um, we kind of switch around what species of native milkweed we do each year. Uh, this year, it's going to be dwarf milkweed that we hand out in the spring. Um, if you don't have monarchs yourselves, but if you see them, um, or any other species at risk, you can give a hoot and call our hoot line. Um, so we have a toll free hotline that we call the hoot line. Um, so it's 1-800-667-HOOT or 4668. And every call in that um, we get um, helps to conserve habitat and determine abundance and distributions um, of that species across Saskatchewan. Um, we never share private private information, so we'll never share your name, um, but all the, that species citing um, information is shared with the Conservation Data Center, so it can go on to inform uh, recovery actions. And with that, I think I went a little fast, but I just wanted to say thank you to our funders 
And are there any questions? First of all, thank you. That was a fabulous presentation. I had no idea there were so many different types of milkweed. So that's really <laughs> interesting to know. <laughs> that was a very thorough presentation. Thank you. And of course, your slides are gorgeous. I already told you this, but they're really gorgeous. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, we have quite a few questions already. It's great. So many people are engaged. So we'll, um, it looks like we've got lots of time. So we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, the first one, which has been upvoted several times um, from Haley. Does Nature Saskatchewan pull data from iNaturalist to assist in narrowing the knowledge gap? Um, or do you work with the SKCDC or have a data sharing agreement in terms of monarchs and milkweeds? Yeah, so we, we don't pull it ourselves, but my understanding is it is also funneled through to the Conservation Data Centre, which is where all our information goes as well. So um, they're kind of like the big um, centre of data for these species. So they house all that information and then um, people that can use it can pull from from them. Um, so that's where all our data goes as well. So um, yeah, we're not using it ourselves, but um, yeah, it is used. <laughs> that's great. Um, and have you ever had any experience with iNaturalist? Um, myself? Yeah, I use it, yes. And what about with Nature Saskatchewan? Um, are you able to get kind of the your members involved with it or...? Yeah, um, we we don't use it too much. Um, we re, uh, we re rely on people to re report their sightings, and then we'll go and um, kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one visit the landowner that has the species if it's not the person that reported the sighting. But um, yeah, we don't we don't use it too much. But it is um, usually we have so many sightings in in the summer that we're not really lacking for things to do and people to approach about the programs but if we were ever you know in a pinch and we didn't really have any sightings and nothing to go on i'm sure we could use it to um you know uh visit those those landholders and see if they'd like to join the program that makes sense um we have um a question from somebody named edna um and edna says hi emily i really like this project and you're sharing all this useful information um i've learned some very interesting facts today um i'm curious about your monitoring program and whether you use temporal parameters to aid in your observations current temperature at time of um of observation um we actually do have a spot in our survey where they can fill out uh what the weather was like that day um uh we haven't really done anything with that information yet but um we do have a spot in the survey that asks those kinds of questions um and we do have a a spot where they can fill in the temperature as well um just to see whether there's like correlation between them not seeing monarchs um and it being you know rainy every time they checked or very cold every time they checked the patch um but that's basically as far as we got with that did that answer the question <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And Edna commented that um, she's curious about iNaturals observations too. I think we answered that already. Um, and Edna's a fourth year Lethbridge College student and um, their undergraduate thesis is developed around milkweed and the prairies. So um, very interesting. Maybe you guys will connect in the future. So yeah, yeah I just let it pass that on. <laughs> um, we've had a few questions about swamp milkweed. Um, can people participate participate in your stewardship programs if they have swamp meat, milkweed is it okay to plant it in Saskatchewan yeah um so there's lots of opinions on this I guess my opinion is oh first of all off um you can always participate in our programs if you have monarchs um so regardless of what kind of milkweed you have um you're if you have monarchs or have to have monarchs you're welcome to um to our program um you can also do the the um, survey part or milkweed monitoring, if you do have swamp milkweed, it is one of the species that I list on the survey. Um, we're trying to promote native milkweed over it, but it is native to the east of us and lots of people have it here. So it is kind of like a more gray species, especially in the eastern part of the province um, where it's really really common for people to buy it. Um, so I think it's still pretty beneficial for the monarchs. Um, it does have thinner leaves than some of the other broad leaf species. So um, there might not be as much uh, area for those caterpillars to munch on, but um, I think it's okay, generally. Um, I have some in my garden, so. <laughs> 
well, if you do it, then it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we actually have lots of people who are interested in, in where can they get milkweed or wildflower seeds? Um, quite a few people have commented about that. Do you have any tips? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we hand out our butterfly mix. So you, if you're interested, you can contact me and I can send you a few packs. Um, and that has kind of a mix of those native uh, nectaring species that I mentioned. Um, but we source our seed actually from uh, Blazing Star Seed Company up in Saskatoon. So uh, you can always contact them. Um, they're a great seed provider um, and they specialize in native species. Um, also, uh, our milkweed this year, our milkweed seedlings are from um, Prairie Originals. So it's just in Manitoba. Um, so it's a native nursery as well. Um, and we get seed from them and then Shan Greenhouse partners with us to uh, grow them over the winter so that we have seedlings in the spring. Um, you just in generally want to source your native plants from as close as possible. So there's like some big native seed um, providers in the States, you don't really want to be ordering or ordering them um, seed from them because uh, those native plants are adapted to Southern climates and they won't do as well here. And then you're mixing genetics with our wild ones. So you kind of just want to source as close to you as possible. So Saskatoon or um, Manitoba, Prairie Originals, there's also, I think it's called Wild About Wildflowers, which is just over the border in Alberta, if you're closer to Alberta. Um, we've also gotten milkweed seeds from them in the past uh, for our milkweed seedlings. So, okay, awesome. So, do people have to be part of your program to be able to get wildflower seeds from you? No, no. Yeah, so you can just contact me, and I'll send them. <laughs> okay, and I'll just send um, a quick chat to everybody. So, your email is outreach at naturesass.ca. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I should have so, put that on the slide, actually. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I'll send it right now um, so that way people can reach out to you. And um, I do want to put a pitch, too, for um, Red and Grills' company, um, Blazing Wildflower Seeds. I know he caps done a lot of um, business with them and they've um, like donated wildflower seeds to, to us just for probably 10 years off the top of my head. Um, and yeah, we've often yeah. given away some of their seeds at... Um, uh, our Native Prairie Appreciation Week um, at our farmers markets booths, we give them away at Agribition. Um, kind of whenever we have an in-person speaker series or the restoration reclamation workshop, um, we always try to give away some wildflower seeds. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for how to grow it? Yeah, so um, each species is a bit different, but um, I would recommend uh, fall sowing um, because then they have the freeze thaw cycle. Um, but uh, sometimes when you plant the seeds, nothing will happen for a few years because they need a few years of that freeze thaw. So I always tell people when I give our seed packets out, um, you know, don't get discouraged if you plant them and nothing comes up that first year or they come up but aren't blooming. Um, it might take another year and then you'll have a huge garden of uh, native plants. So that's what happened when um, I get like the leftover seed packs sometimes. So uh, I planted quite a few and um, that's what happened with me. Uh, nothing the first year and then the second year I had more more plants than I knew what to do with, so. <laughs> wow, that's fabulous. Um, what about wild harvesting? Have you ever done that or do you know anyone who has? Um, yeah, uh, you'd want the permission from whoever's property you're on. And then um, there is a rule of, um, um, that you only take a certain percentage of whatever's there uh, because you don't want to deplete that seed um, stock from the wild population, of course. Um, so yeah, you'd want to be careful with that. But um, yeah, that's a good option if you knew if you knew the person or if you have it on your your pasture in your pasture, lots of uh, forbs or wildflowers, and you wanted to collect some of that seed and plant it in your yard. Um, I could, I should also mention, I have um, heard that you can force that like freeze thaw germination by sticking the seeds in your fridge. So I have heard of people that do that too. Yeah. Um, I've personally never had good luck with wildflower seeds. I can grow anything else but wildflowers. <laughs> um, but I know PCAP has on our YouTube channel um, from the Native Prairie Restoration Reclamation Workshop, um, Gail Fenner did a really cool, um, like a webinar about the, they call it stratification where you have to 
mm -hmm. simulate that freeze thaw method to be able to germinate to wildflower seeds. And um, I think there's a few on there too about um, wild harvesting as well. So if anyone's interested in more about that, you can check out our YouTube channel. So yeah, um, and back to the questions. <laughs> uh, Teresa <laughs> is wondering what, um, if you know of any wildflower seeds in Alberta, any companies there? Um, yeah, so that Wild About Wildflowers, I'm pretty sure that's what they're called. Um, they're in Alberta, and we have gotten seed for our uh, milkweed. Last year, we bought seed for um, uh, uh, any of our closer providers. Didn't have any last year. It wasn't apparently a very good year for milkweed seeds. So uh, we did order our seed last year um, uh, from them, and it grew, and it was great. We got lots of milkweed seedlings from them, so... Um, I'm pretty sure they're in Southern Alberta, I think. Okay. And <laughs> like, obviously you're with Nature Saskatchewan, but does Nature Alberta have a program like this or do they do something completely different? You know, I, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure there is a Nature Alberta. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so I, I'm not sure about their programming if they do. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Maybe, and so. <laughs> we did have somebody write in here that the Edmonton Native Plant Society might also have some milkweed seeds. So um, for our attendees from Alberta, be sure to check that out. Um, that sounds like a great resource. And I think they also did a webinar for us a few years ago, the Edmonton Native Plant Society. Yeah. Uh, Native um, plant societies are also a great resource and there's, there's a bunch of them right across the prairie. So <laughs> absolutely. Um, so Emily, there is a question about um, tagging. I just have to find it here. We got lots of questions coming in. So would you ever consider expanding your stewardship program to include tagging of monarchs? Um, likely not uh, for our, our uses. We just don't have the capacity to, to do that. Um, uh, but it would be really cool if somebody wanted to. <laughs> Um, it would be really cool and fun, but likely our programs would never, would never do that. We just, um, we are, we have over a thousand participants and there's three of us working on the program. So it's a lot of work keeping up with everybody as is. So we likely wouldn't have the capacity to expand to that, but, um, yeah. It sounds like it'd be a great master's or PhD project for somebody. Yes, for sure. I would be very interested in reading about it if somebody did do it. So. Absolutely. Um, and there's a request if you can share the slide on the um, the overview for best management practices for supporting monarchs. Could you go back to that? Sure. This one? Yeah, I think that was it. But um, that was Lisa that requested that. So Lisa, if that's not the right one, just, just let us know and we can flip somewhere else. Um, I should mention that we are recording this presentation and I'm gonna try my best to have it uploaded on YouTube later today. And then uh, you'll be able to watch it at your convenience again. So if you miss something or you wanna go back um, and have reference, then um, it'll be there for all of eternity. Um, okay, so next question. Um, do you know of any predators of monarch butterflies that have, um, that eat them without worrying about the toxins? Um, and this is from Jazz and Jazz says, I know some predators, ha um, have ways like loggerhead trikes impaling them. Any comments? Yeah. So, um, going back to loggerhead trikes, I have heard, um, so I also run shrubs for trikes and they do this across their range with a number of like less desirable tasting insects or lizards um uh where they'll impale them and they'll wait for the toxins to break down and then eat them um i haven't heard a lot about them doing that here um uh but things do eat them because we do have like caterpillars that people have, are watching day after day just all disappear all at once um but i should know more about who specifically eats them <laughs> um than i do Oh, it's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a, a listener named Chris is wondering, um, the monarchs that arrive in Saskatchewan, do they migrate back to California or Mexico? Or do you know where exactly they go? The ones that arrive here in the spring, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So, so they'll, they'll, the ones that arrive here are one of those short lived generations. So they'll um, live out their life cycle here um, and breed and lay eggs once they arrive here. And then the ones that hatch here in the later summer. So sometimes there's 
you know, one generation, sometimes we might have two breeding here, but then the ones that hatch here kind of in August, um, they would be the ones that fly all the way back down um, south. And then I should mention in North America, there's kind of two populations of monarchs. Um, so the California ones, they stay on that side of the Rockies. So they're not the ones that arrive here. Okay. That's interesting. That's good to know. So ours tend to go towards Mexico then. Yeah. I have okay. a picture. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So you can kind of see that the Rocky Mountains have a little barrier there. Yeah. Okay. I didn't notice that when you put that slide up. But <laughs> there you go. Thank you for that answer. Um, that looks like all the questions that we have at the moment. Um, we've had lots of people type in um, awesome presentation. Um, thank you so much. I've been learning a lot. Great information. Excellent presentation. And thank you. So um, I just want to reiterate all of these fabulous comments from people. Um, thank you again for, for sharing your enthusiasm with us and your beautiful slides. So thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was, it was really fun. So <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, to all of our listeners out there, um, thanks so much for catching the last Native Prairie Speaker Series webinar of 2023. Uh, be sure to check out our first one about burrowing owls in on January 25th. Um, and that'll be you can just register on the PCAP YouTube channel, or sorry, the PCAP website for that. Um, over the break, be sure to check out the PCAP YouTube channel. There's some really awesome resources available there. We've got other um, webinars about butterflies, and this is the only one about monarchs, but we've got other butterflies um, that are listed as at-risk species. We also have lots of resources about native plants, um, native wildflowers, how to do it, um, everything you need to know, and you can just use the magnifying glass to search for a specific topic. Um, and then when you leave today's webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. So if you don't mind filling that out, we really appreciate that. And we can keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Bye.